Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Quality of Life show with Nancy and Lisa. Today, we welcome Dr. Jean Kenakogi. She is the daughter of Rena, who's known as Rusty Kenakogi, uh, who is known really as the mother of women's judo. You cool. know what? This is so cool. We love mother-daughter <laughs> stories. And this this is, Nancy, this is the kick-ass mother-daughter story, don't yeah. you think? Yeah. Are we allowed to say that? Um, yeah. I, we have to Why be not? careful because Jean is a special agent for the U.S. government. She's not only a special agent, she's a senior special agent, so you never know. Uh, but Jean is a fifth degree black belt in judo and is also a sensei. Um, joining us today to talk about her mom's memoir that she co-wrote with her, it's called Get Up and Fight, the memoir of Rena Rusty Kanakogi, mm-hmm. the mother of women's judo. You can get it now. And I encourage you to go to their website, RustyKanakogi.com, and that's K-A-N-O-K-O-G-I, RustyKanakogi.com. So welcome to the show, Jean. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for having me. I love the mother and daughter team. You know, thank thank you. you. I know you know about that as well. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I don't think you can be as real with anybody as much as with your mom and your mom with a daughter, and it can be really good or it can really kick you in the butt (laughs) well I had both it was really good and she kicked my butt a lot uh we choked each other where else can you proudly say that your mother choked you at least three times a week regularly wow no way see this is crazy that's crazy. but then people would think no way then people always talk to Nancy and I like how do you travel and work and play together I'm like it's not all roses you're gonna have your time Mm -hmm. you're gonna have your moment where we have to like deliberate (laughs) But you got to choke each other out. No, but that, but that's, yeah. a, huh. I actually want to back up on all of it though, and talk about judo. So, you know, I was talking about you coming on a show to a couple of friends and I'm like, okay, what, which one is judo? So let's talk about judo because um, it is, it is also a very good practice for focus and meditation, right? And also strength. And there's just so much about it. So can we start with what judo is? Sure. Judo is actually uh, the gentle way. Believe it or not, it's broken down, even though we throw each other through the mat. It's really the gentle way. You use your opponent's uh, movements in the direction that they want to move, and you just help them move along a little bit faster and a little bit closer to the ground. So and judo then you can- choke them. <laughs> yeah, that too. Well, judo consists of uh, multiple throws, chokes, arm locks and pins. So you can throw somebody and score uh, a full point, you would win the match. And then there's different breakdowns of less than a full point. And same thing with pins, you have to pin them for X amount of seconds and you can win by a full point. But if you pin them for a certain amount of time and they escape, you still can get a point depending on the time. Uh, The arm locks, you can actually put an arm bar or an arm lock on somebody. And there's two ways to win by a full point with that. Either they give up or their arm gives out. Uh, It's easier uh, to try to get out of it. But, uh, you you know, we've seen that in the professional wrestling uh, in the PFL Mm -hmm. and the MMA with Ronda Rousey and Kayla Harrison, who are arm bar magnificence. Yeah. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they do amazing arm bars. So that's an example of what a judo arm bar looks like. And with the chokes, there's two ways. There, there's uh, chokes where it's not like you come in and you just do a strangle on somebody and just shake them. <laughs> it, there's actual judo techniques that are chokes. And these chokes, uh, either the person submits and taps out or they go out. Uh, so those are two ways to win. So even though it's called the gentle way, um, there is a lot of philosophy with judo. And we'll talk about that later on how Rusty applied the philosophy and right. how I live the philosophy. Uh, one of them is jitsu kyo which is the mutual benefit for all. So that's why we bow to each other in judo. We bow, we look down, and we really have respect for the mat, for the referees, and for our opponent, because our opponent is allowing us to become a better us. And that really Mm -hmm. crosses over into even resiliency because it allows us to be a better us Mm -hmm. and allows the opponent to be a better them. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other other philosophy is really just maximizing your effort and and involving all. It's it's very... uh, uh, very orient, uh, it's oriented towards really gathering everybody on the same playing field. And uh, that 
really speaks to diversity, inclusion, uh, empowerment. And that's a lot of what judo brings. It brings a sense of belonging, of friendship. Uh, and, and you mentioned mindfulness earlier. Well, if your mind is not directly involved in what you're doing with your opponent, your mind is going to be looking up at the ceiling in about a moment because mm -hmm. they're going to throw you. So mm -hmm. you really, your mind, judo and, and most martial arts really promote mindfulness and you don't even realize that you're doing it and you're almost in a meditative state when you're practicing because it's not just the physical uh, practice of judo, but it's the mental practice of judo. You learn early on, even as a child, to visualize the techniques because you can't, you can't ask your body to do something unless your mind is, is going there. Mm. And especially movements that are not customarily normal, like walking. Walking, most people, you don't have to think about it. it it's just something automatic. But executing a throw like Harai Goshi, you have to learn that. You have to learn how to twist, how to turn, how to pull your body. And then you learn where your body is physically located. So many people are not aware mm. of their own body. Doesn't matter if you're big, if you're little, uh, if you're coordinated, if you're athletic, doesn't matter. So many people have zero recognition of where their body is. Oh, I didn't know I was doing that. How many times do you hear that in life? And mm -hmm. judo actually makes you mindful of your own body, of where your foot actually is. Like, if, you know, some people, they could stand and, and be exercising and not even know that a part of their body is their elbow is completely sticking out. Uh, when you play softball or baseball, some people don't realize that, you know, you have to tuck your arm and they're like, oh, I didn't know where my elbow is. Well, in judo, if you don't know where your elbow is, your opponent's certainly going to find it and arm lock you. Oh. This kind of reminds me, Nancy and I used to teach music, uh, uh, mm. musical organ. And, um, and people would go, oh, I can't carry a tune in the bucket. I'm like, well, here, I'll teach you three notes. You've, you've played something, you know, and, and that's kind of that same thing. And it's and I think we almost shut down ourselves about a, a, a gaining knowledge and applying it we just go no there's like a negative there's that. a neurological thing that we always have this negative before positive and so I think that's what's interesting I, I know mm. so many friends who are involved in martial arts and you think oh what you just want to kill people <laughs> you want to just nail them and they're like no it is actually taken in my life into this positive turn of mindfulness and yeah, understand yeah and i i know people who've gotten through addiction actually with with through martial arts you know so it's interesting about that positive yeah. side when i taught art um the first thing people said was i can't draw a straight line and i always said well i haven't asked you to do that that's why we have rulers you know <laughs> you, nobody asked you to draw a straight line as part of art but well, that was always the thing. And I that's do that's it. a great segue. I mean, just speaking, mm -hmm. Lisa, to what you said, human beings are naturally negative on themselves. We, we're 80% negative and we really mm -hmm. have to shift that focus and really mm -hmm. redirect our thinking mm -hmm. uh, to something a little bit more positive. And we are the least compassionate towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are so compassionate, so humanitarian towards other fellow human beings, but towards ourselves, you ever do something that, uh, I don't know, put, uh, put flour in your coffee instead of sugar. And what's the first thing you do is you self-deprecate. The mm -hmm. first thing you do, you say, oh, you're such a, well, would you tell that to your friend who accidentally did that? No, we would be more compassionate to your friend. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn to be a little bit more compassionate towards ourselves. And Nancy, what you said, as far as I can't draw a straight line, well, you know what? Neither did Jackson Pollock or Lee Krasner Pollock. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Exactly. And, and, and you know what? Lee Krasner Pollock was my great aunt. No and way. She, yeah. Cool. And she could, my mom uh, was, uh, my mom and, and she drew a lot of her toughness from Lee Krasner. And <laughs> Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner Pollock, I bet you they probably, they never said, I can't draw a straight line. They probably said, I won't draw a straight line. And, yeah, now, look, and now look at the paintings. Yeah. yeah. See, this is what's so interesting. Wow, so cool. your mom, let's talk about your mm. mom, Rusty. I like the name. So you got, okay, you're going to be the hammer or the nail, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be Rusty and don't mess with me. I love the name <laughs> Rusty. And I want to talk about how she got that. But her start, I mean, it was running around the streets of Brooklyn, apparently. And, you know, then 
you know, judo comes into her life. How did that happen? And here she really stood up for women. And as you do, you continue on this legacy, um, not only in judo, but just for women and inequality, which I love. And Nancy and I both, um, we still have to let people know that women can do things. And um, your mom, you know, winning her first title and it being taken away, like, yeah, that sucks. I have to watch my language when I hear things like this. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Well, you know, it, it's it's such a, a great story because in Rusty's story, you can really pick out these words of empowerment and inspiration. Mm-hmm. And before she even knew how to pronounce them or spell them, she was living them. Mm-hmm. And that's how you're really true to yourself and you find your purpose is you actually live your purpose. Mm-hmm. So with Rusty, she grew up in, a, in Coney Island in Brooklyn, New York in the, in the 1950s. And mm-hmm. she, she had such a tumultuous childhood. Her father was a gambling man. He was always drinking, uh, very absentee, took the family money constantly. And they lived in a small railroad apartment. So Rusty's mom, my grandmother, worked in a candy factory in Coney Island. Oh, wow. And yeah, yeah. She, but unfortunately, back then, you know, the labor laws were a lot different. So she got her hand mangled in one of the machines and to continue working, she had to take something, I think it was called Pantapone, which was an Mm. opioid back then. And Mm. uh, then she kept on always having pain and she kept on taking more and more of the opioids. And that's pretty much how she sustained her life was with through uh, the opioids and nicotine. Yeah. So it, it, and, and Rusty's parents didn't really talk to each other. They threw things at each other. They were yelling at Yidd- in Yiddish and German at each other. So wow. the big family uh, grounding wasn't there. So when Rusty was growing up, she had babysitters. And given that she was in Coney Island, her babysitters were actually the stars of what sadly back then they called the freak show. And her two babysitters were, mm-hmm. well, the Pinhead sisters which were these really sweet sisters and they just had smaller heads. So they put them in a freak show and call them pinheads. And Milo, the mule faced boy, which really was a young man who was just very, very kind and sweet. And he had, uh, I guess, buck teeth. And, but that's, they just renamed him mule faced boy and, and they made him sing on stage and really exploited these people, which is horrific, but that's what they did in the fifties. So these were her babysitters and she said the pinhead sisters and Milo showed her at a very young age that it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter people calling you names. It's how you treat others and Mm -hmm. how, uh, how they make you feel around them. And Rusty felt like family. She belonged because Rusty was also different. She was bigger than most Mm -hmm. outspoken more than most. And she was always, she was rough around the edges. And the big thing in Coney Island, she was the Jewish kid. They were, everybody else were the Catholic kids. So she was the Jewish kid. So she was the anomaly of the area anyway. Mm. So they really embraced her, but she also built her character knowing that you just don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah. And you take people for how they treat you and how they treat others. Mm. You know, people could say, oh, I'm this and I'm that and I'm this, but Rusty said, you know what? Show it. Don't, don't say it, show it. Mm. And she, she held people accountable. And that resonated throughout her life. So fast forward a little bit. Uh, she became a street gang leader of a female gang called the Apaches because she had all this pent up energy. Uh, she got involved. She <laughs> recruited these gang members, these other females, and they had these chartreuse jackets and pedal pushers, uh, something like right out of, out of the movie Grease, but they actually fought with other neighborhood females. Oh, wow. And no weapons back then. Uh, you know, back then it was strictly fist fighting, schoolyard fist fighting. Uh, one mm-hmm. day she was supposed to have a schoolyard fight with uh, another group and the other group showed up, but her, the rest of her gang did not show up. And Rusty Ooh. took every bump and bruise that they gave her. Then all with her face all muddied and bloodied, she went to each and every one of these girls' houses that were supposed to be in her gang. And she beat mm. the daylights out of each one. Oh. <laughs> it was all wow. about accountability. If you give your word, if you say you're going to do something, you do it. Mm. Wow. And back then there were no cell phones to text to say, hey, not making it. 
<laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Late for the yeah, flight. No, that, don't yeah. do it. Oh. Yeah. Well, with all of this pent up energy, Rusty started making some poor choices and ran in some bad crowds. And uh, she didn't, she got shot at. Uh, she, act, I, I think the bullet grazed her. Uh, she was arrested and she was put in the woman's house of detention as a young girl. But at the same time, she also had a job at Ma Bell back then. So they made excuses for her saying that she was out on sick leave or something to hold her job until mm. she can get out of jail. Wow. And, uh, she managed to get out and she said, that's it. I have to turn my life around. I mm. can't do this. I really need to do something with my life to make uh, something meaningful. And uh, she thought maybe, you know, at this young age, at 18, she married her first husband. Hey, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm a woman. I'm a married woman. Uh, she was, pre she got pregnant and that's it. I'm going to be a mother. Um, that, that's it. This is me. Unfortunately, her first mm -hmm. husband had a uh, drinking problem and mm -hmm. It was, it was very, it was, it was normal back then, I guess, for a lot of drinking problems in these areas, but she went to Al-Anon because she wanted to really be supportive of him. And, uh, he, as she was in Al-Anon, he was at the bar. So that mm -hmm. really wasn't working out too well. But when she was mm -hmm. in Al-Anon, she met a friend and he looked really strong. Like he worked out. So she just asked him, Hey, what do you do? What do you work out? Because Rusty was into fitness, into working mm -hmm. out. Uh, part of her, what she used to do is her workout. She would used to lift the bus stop signs. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, but back then the bus stop signs were these concrete, uh, they look like concrete flower pots with a stick or with a metal rod. And she would just hmm. lift these things as her exercise. So she was curious what this guy did. And he told her, well, this was back in 1955. Well, I do judo. Now, at that time, uh, she didn't know what judo was. And he said, well, you know, it's a Japanese martial art. And at that time, World War II, let's see, 1955. So this was not a good mm -hmm. time to want to learn something, especially oh, from yeah. Japan or from Germany. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and being a Jewish female, you just didn't want to go. Oh, my there. gosh. Yeah. But when um, he said, well, let me show you. So he picked her up on a hip throw. And he lifted her like she was a piece of paper now. She was five foot nine, 200 pounds. Wow. And she just went flying. She said, you know what? I just forgave Japan for every misdeed. I have to learn this. Mm -hmm. And she followed oh. him back to his YMCA where he learned judo. Uh, mm -hmm. And he said, okay, I'll introduce you to the class. You know, he wasn't thinking there was any issue with it. Well, the, the judo instructor said, I'm sorry, no women are allowed. Women can't practice judo. And she persisted and she persisted mm -hmm. and they finally let her in the class. The deal was she would learn judo one day and they came up with a great idea. Then she would turn around and teach judo the next day to the beginners and especially to other women. Oh. So the mm -hmm. two about this is that one, it was at a YMCA, which is the Young Men's Christian Association. And here mm -hmm. she is, a Jewish girl in Brooklyn. Huh. Number two, when they were advertising her judo class, in the local newspaper, it would learn, learn judo with Rena Rusty Stewart at the time. And in the same on the same page, you had an ad, how to serve your husband and treat and press his pants. Oh. <laughs> you know, just talk about the times, you know, how to be a good <clears throat> wife to your husband and make sure he has a oh hot cup of coffee when he comes home. Oh, no. And you're going to be dressed in saran wrap when he comes home. It's getting to that era. Yes. Oh, that was <laughs> the 70s. It evolved. <laughs> Wait, wasn't, wasn't that in fried green tomatoes? <laughs> Something like that. Some crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there was, that, was that book. The, um, oh, gosh. Is it the now. Joy of Sex written by M? And she had all these really insane how you should please your husband ideas. And, and one was that you would greet him at the door wrapped in saran wrap with nothing else on, obviously. But like, okay. Why? Well, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> to look like a sandwich? I don't <laughs> no, know. Just because you're, and I guess because obviously you could see, but um you're still kind of close Wrinkled. and he had to unwrap you. So you didn't miss the fun of unwrapping. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So, so this is what's going on. But, well, this is what women have gone through 
And here she is doing completely like, hello, I'm going to kick your butt. Yeah. Well, here she was. Now she's learning judo. And uh, in 1959, she went with her team to the YMCA championships in Utica, New York. So she went there and she brought her judo uniform, which we call a judo gi with her. So she could be part of the warm up. They have form practice mm -hmm. and she could pretty, pretty much what you call being a body to be able to help warm them up. And uh, as she was on the mat and she was warming up with them, she used to think, wow, wouldn't it be great if I could compete here, if women can compete as well? Because mm -hmm. I mean, there were just no women there and she just assumed women were not allowed. Well, she heard a scream on the other side of the mat and she looked over and unfortunately it was one of her teammates. He blew, he hurt his leg or he blew out his knee mm -hmm. or something during warm up. The coach called her over and said, hey, Rusty, get ready, I'm putting you in in his place. But I don't want you to call attention to yourself. You have to keep it low key. So mm -hmm. Rusty took this very seriously. She went and they didn't have any female locker room. So she went into the closet, into the janitorial closet or into a mm -hmm. bathroom stall. And uh, she took an ACE bandage and she wrapped her chest. Mm -hmm. She wasn't, uh, she, she had short hair. She, she was big and tall and strong. But just to make sure that it wasn't a giveaway that she was a woman, she put it around her chest uh, mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. look even more androgynous. Mm -hmm. And she got into the, into the competition. She saw her opponent. It was this big hulking guy. He was staring her down like guys who were about to fight do. She bowed onto the mat, bowed to the referee. And she remembers the coach said, just pull a draw. And she's thinking, but I trained just like all mm -hmm. of this, just like this guy. I mm. trained with the other guys. I trained just like my teammate who I'm taking his place. Why should I have yeah. to just pull a draw? Because why, why don't I have the burden of expecting yeah. to win? It's unfair that they remove that burden from me just yeah. because I'm a woman. So as she was competing, she heard her team yelling, go rusty. She heard in her, in her mind's eye, go rusty. And she just went for it. It was like a battle, a, a real battle, because in order to get your grip in judo, it's almost like a fist fight to grab exactly where you want to grab on the judo gi. And she got her grip and she came in for a throw. She committed herself 100%. And boom, she threw this guy for a full point, smashed him. Well, they got up, they bowed out and her team was just so excited because now her team won first place. Wow. Not only did she win, but her team now that was, that was the decision to make her, to give her team that needed point to win first place. They all got their medals. They got the team cool. trophy. And then the tournament director called her aside and uh -huh. he asked for a word. And she, I remember her telling me, and, and it's really highlighted in the book that she said, wow, well, first of all, I can't believe I got a medal instead of a citation for fighting. That's number one. I didn't have to go to jail for fighting. This is great. The next thing is she thought when this guy said, hey, let me have a word. He, maybe he's going to compliment me on my technique or he's going to say, hey, well done. But then when somebody says they want to talk to you, the first thing that our minds mm. go to again yep. is the negativity yep. is, oh boy. Yeah. So he didn't mince his words he just looked at her and, and he was so accusatory and he goes are you a girl like like she did something wrong and at that time she felt like she did everything be wrong just for being a woman and she just held her mm -hmm. head high and said no I'm a woman right mm -hmm. on and he said well I'm going to need that medal back because your team's otherwise going to have to forfeit because women are not allowed to compete here you're not allowed and no oh. She talked to her coach and her teammates and they said, no, Rusty, you don't give that. You, you, you don't give that back. Mm, uh, but she decided, you know what? No, I have the respect of my teammates and they earned this. There's no reason why they should be punished because mm. they're not the woman. So she hands the medal back to this guy. And um, she was thinking in her mind, like, I'm not like she was, she wanted to cry so bad, but she's like, this guy doesn't even deserve my emotion. And mm -hmm. she hand that medal back. And that was the pivotal moment in her life where she said, no woman will ever suffer such an indignity ever again, not on my watch, not mm -hmm. in my world. I have to do something. What that something mm -hmm. is, I don't know, but I'm going to change this. This is never going to happen again.
Hmm. Gave the medal back. And in 1959 was the pivotal moment of her life. And everybody, every woman now that puts on a judo gi that says, I want to be an Olympian. I want to be a world champion can only say that because of Rusty and that moment. That's awesome. So fr- thank you. Thank you. And, and from there, this is where the flourishing happened. Rusty found her purpose, although it was there all along. And in that purpose was a lot of other good stuff. So she decided women's judo needs to be in the nationals. There was no national tournament for women. Uh, and, in, and furthermore, women, uh, judo in general was not even heard of in the Olympics yet. 1964 was the first time men's judo was allowed into the Olympics. And that was in, in Japan, in Tokyo. Uh, she wanted at least women to start competing. And so she was teaching more women and she found a woman here, found a woman there. And in 1974, she got a team together to go compete in the nationals. The first time women were allowed in the nationals but that was the beginning to the end um, and the end to the beginning. Mm. She was supposed to fight in one weight category, but her very best friend Maureen was also in that weight category. So Rusty decided I'm going to go down a division and lose 12 pounds overnight. She put on a sauna suit, did everything she could in the sauna, jumped up and down, got on the scale. Um, She made the weight and then landed in the hospital for dehydration. Oh. Yeah. So, so that, that was the end of that. But now Rusty said, this is what I have to do. She was the coach of the US team. They started putting together a team to go and compete overseas at the British Open, the French Open, the German Open. The Europeans were way ahead of us mm. in having all of these international opens. Uh, Rusty was telling USA Judo at the time, hey, I want to, you know, we should compete internationally in women's judo. And at the time, USA Judo was run by a bunch of misogynists, a bunch of good old boys saying, oh, hell no, we're not going to have any women competing. Oh, no, women shouldn't be competing. Uh, They even told her at one point, well, you know, your reproductive parts might get hurt. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, then men should quit judo because our parts are on the inside. Yours are not. No. <laughs> Hello. Well, I just actually want to Ouch. touch on this on the on the men female thing, because <laughs> judo and you think about martial arts, who started it? What, was it a man who created judo, who, who came up with the practice, and the art of judo and uh, or, you know, in Japan, mm-hmm. were women allowed in that? Because that's a whole other thing, too. Was it just really here, our country in the beginning? Or was this something globally that had to, I mean, maybe Europe was ahead, but when you think about martial arts, I always think it was always men and women, not so much. So where were we on that historically speaking in the art of judo? I love that you asked that because I actually missed a slight time frame, something extremely important. And had it not been for this trip to Japan, I wouldn't even exist. So after Rusty, after the 1959 uh, tournament, You see, judo was, uh, the father of judo was Professor Jigoro Kano, Mm -hmm. a Japanese man. But in his writings, if you really read them carefully, he never excluded women. He Mm -hmm. included everyone. It wasn't explicit the way in his writings, but he never uh, said, no, this is for men only. Mm -hmm. So Rusty got to go to Japan. She, she went and she trained in Japan, which in, the 19, in 1962 was again, unheard of. A yeah. woman getting on a flight, a single mom at the time, getting on a flight, going to Japan. She didn't speak the language, uh, hardly had any money. They, they raised some money and, and a friend of a friend let her borrow his friends and family plane pass. I mean, back then it was so different. She goes to Japan and she goes to train at the Kodokan. And that is like the Mecca, the Mm -hmm. main, main place for judo. They had the men's side and they had the women's side. So the women's side, all of the, all the women were doing kata, which is form practice of judo. So it was non-combative and it was really getting the form down to a science. And Rusty learned a lot from these women, uh, these women. Uh, She became Mm -hmm. friends with Sensei Keiko Fukuda, who was, uh, 
one of the, the mother of Kata. She was just amazing. And uh, all of these women that she trained with, but Rusty was hungry for more. Rusty wanted to fight. She wanted the combative side of it. So she, again, just like she did at the YMCA, she went and to the men's side and kept asking. Finally, one of the, the senior men said, okay, let her in. Well, she embodied the term, the Japanese mantra, fall down seven, get up eight, because that's mm -hmm. all she did. They included her, they treated her like one of the guys and they kept on throwing her and she would get in a couple of throws here and there. She would just keep mm -hmm. getting up. She would not stop. And it's interesting because she made some really good friends. And one friend used to watch her from uh, behind the curtain. He was scared of her. He, later on, he admitted, he's like, I was scared of her. I didn't know what to think. Who was this gigantic mm -hmm. New York woman? And he mm -hmm. went home uh, and his father said, hey, did you see that woman on television at the Kodakon, the American? And he said, oh yeah, she's my friend. He said, well, you have to marry her. She's gonna give oh. you big babies. <laughs> so my father ended up marrying her. Oh, well, there you and go. Here, and here's the big baby right you here. You go, girl. You go, girl. So, so <laughs> this funny. is, you know, this whole full circle moment of just going for it. And it's kind of like, almost like blind passion where your body just keeps making you go forward. It's interesting about that because I, I think that she had that chutzpah, right? Of not letting anybody say no. And I think... You know, that's something important in life mm -hmm. now. And, and women still, we are still fighting for yeah. our oh, rights. Yeah. We're and fighting we for all. Yeah, probably will. Yeah. Just, just and sometimes I think this is all. I don't want to get religious. I think it stems from the Bible. Uh Oh, we're going to get. Into yeah. It, I mean, seriously, because we weren't like our own person. We had to be made from somebody else's rib. It's mankind. So so therefore <laughs> if it wasn't for men we wouldn't be here and I keep thinking logically if it wasn't for women nobody would be here so I mean it takes both it does it takes both yeah. and you know with Rusty believe it or not it was not just women that supported her mm. men got got on board with her men sure. believed in her uh, matter of fact so we fast forward and she, she wanted women's judo to be in the Olympics. How do we do this? How do we, how do we figure this out? So they just, uh, the US judo told her, well, Rusty, you wanna have women's judo considered as an Olympic sport? Well, we need a world championships and we need, and in order to have a world championships, mm -hmm. you have to have 125 people from X amount of countries and okay, so go ahead. Mm -hmm. It was like a schoolyard fight. Like, yeah, you want yeah. this? Well, go ahead. Go, 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 yeah. go away, little girl. Figure it out. She goes, you know what? We will. We will have a world championships. He goes, and then I remember him, uh, the conversation. He said, oh, yeah, well, where? And of course, Rusty said, well, Madison Square Garden in oh, New yeah. York. <laughs> Just like that. And after she said those words, you know, she's a woman of conviction. And also, she didn't want to say, well, I was kidding. No. She uh -huh. said, that's it. So she came to our judo class that night and she said, well, guys, I have an announcement. We're holding a world championships at Madison Square Garden. Needless to say, my father just dropped whatever was in his hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our senior students said, well, Rusty, how are you going to do that? I think there's like $140 in the bank. Uh, that was uh -huh. it. She was determined. Mm -hmm. And not only was she determined, but she got donations. One of the bigger sponsors was uh, Sassone Jeans. Paul Gez was oh. one of the sponsors. And a man who had yeah. no, no idea about judo, Sassone had nothing to do with judo, but she got him involved. Another mm -hmm. person that was so helpful was back then Percy Sutton. He was, he was one of, um, he was with the Harlem Boys Choir. And he oh. was helpful. So the majority of people that jumped in to help were men, Pony Sports. Mm. Uh, Pony Sports is uh, one of their executives helped as well as one of, uh, he assigned one of his staff to full-time help with this world championship. Wow. So people had no idea why they were helping, but they knew that something was moving in the right direction and they had to help. They felt compelled because it was such a force. And as mm. Rusty was moving forward, uh, Dr. Matsumai, at the time, he was the new president 
of the International Judo Federation. Now, Rusty was thinking, oh no, uh, the Japanese mindset, they're gonna be against women competing. Mm -hmm. Well, boy, was she wrong. Uh, Dr. Matsumai was even sort of a feminist and he, he was an educator. He believed that uh, equality should happen all across the board. Mm. And he came through with helping with the funding in the 11th hour to keep the doors open of Madison Square Garden and help Rusty because he not only believed in women's judo and sports mm. and equality, he believed in Rusty. Mm. So they I just want to say this is such a huge thing for back then, too, because like now mm -hmm. we have like, oh, let's throw a concert to make this happen. We're going to make that happen. And we can do it from a touch of the keyboard. Obviously, you're writing an email and you can affect through mm -hmm. social media back then. This is pre Google, pre email. This is, you know, even pre fax machine. Work. Right. Or it was fax. I don't know. Telex. It, telex. Oh, yeah. Telex. See, it, mm. this is really You've got to think this was just not that easy back then. And I, I want to touch on the Olympics, that importance, because we've done we, uh, the interview, Nancy, about uh, Cooper team. Um, mm -hmm. But the, mm -hmm. the Olympics, even keeping the Olympics going was has hard. been a, a strife. Um, you know, the, the Cooper team wanted it and then they took it away. And he was like, he envisioned the Olympics as world peace. And if you read mm -hmm. the history of the Olympics, it's pretty darn amazing. So your mom fits right in there going, mm -hmm. this is part of it, you know, mm -hmm. inclusivity. She, she does. She does. And, you know, with, so after this world championships, then she said, okay, well, here we are. Let's get into the 84 Olympics. Well, they said, well, you need another world championships and more international tournaments. She teamed up with Dr. Matsumai and she, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Matsumai held the first Fukuoka championships in 1983 in Japan. So the Japanese women can compete internationally on their home turf. And this is a tournament that everybody's still talking about because we felt like superstars. I actually competed in that one. I made the US team and yeah. I competed at the first okay. Fukuoka and it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, people, the kids would come up and ask us for our autographs. It was just yeah. absolutely incredible. In 1982 in Paris, there was another world championships. She felt with all of this, that's it. We're in 1984, mm -hmm. it's in Los Angeles. Well, they told her no. Mm -hmm. That was not happening. No is not part of Rusty's vocabulary. At the same time, Rusty was fighting and, and battling for equality in women's judo. She teamed up with Billie Jean King and the Women's yeah. Sports Foundation and, and fought for Title IX. Mm. So she's part of that Title IX fight and Title IX movement. Well, mm. Rusty was told no. She teamed up with the American Civil Liberties Union and decided to sue the International Olympic Committee for Discrimination. Yeah. He wanted to put an injunction on the entire games in 1984. Wow. She was, <laughs> yeah, you know, she was, they, they See, used to Cooper call it- Cooper team wouldn't want all this stuff to have had, had, had to have happened, <laughs> you know, historically, when you think about what they started and now what you're saying, this is like insane. Like it, it needs to happen, but like that was not the original vision. I don't believe I could be wrong. Well, Rusty wanted that. Uh, she wanted the inclusion. Yeah. She said, you know, women deserve it. They train their guts out. They absolutely mm -hmm. deserve it. So she got these petitions signed from everybody all over the world to support her lawsuit and her possible injunction on the entire Olympics. Fast forward, wow. she knew that she still had work to do. Okay, 84, it wasn't happening. And then in 1988, she was still told no. Finally, with every lawsuit and the help of the ACLU and all of the, uh, the force wow. and the pressure, the men had to give up one weight category to have three weight divisions for women. And hmm. in 1988, Rusty marched into the stadium as the US coach and was the Olympic coach with her hmm. three, person uh, three person team uh, that marched in. And that was her gold medal. Women's judo was now an exhibition inclusion in 1988. And in 1992 in Barcelona, it was completely fully included. And what's really cool about this year's Olympics is judo is returning home to the motherland. Mm. And because of the mother of women's judo, this is the first time ever they will have a mixed team tournament, equal men, equal women. Wow. 
How cool is that? That's judo cool. The motherland, and because of the mother of women's judo, this has happened. This is so uh, cool. Now, are you going to compete? Where are you on, in competing? Uh, I'm retired. I was mm -hmm. um, I was one of the heavyweight fighters on the U.S. judo team. Uh, I blew out my knee right before '88, so mm -hmm. that killed. You know, it was it was so bittersweet because I was so happy women's judo was included. That was my dream. I was I was going to win that gold medal in '88, mm -hmm. and then I ended up uh, having a gold medal surgery instead. Yeah, uh, I blew it out at the Pan American, so that killed my Olympic dream. But my mother had her Olympic dream. We get together, wanted... right? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, I know, uh, and you know, writing the book together was it something? I know she's passed on now, and sorry about that, but she's alive in so many yeah. women, right? And and around the world through this and through what you're doing, was she writing the memoir, or did you write it together, or did you take her notes? And I mean, because I know she's co-author, and Billie Jean King is, uh, you know, in the in the introductions as well. Um, so how did this all come together doing this memoir? Because I know it's been in the works. Well, in 2004, 2005, Rusty was shopping around. She wanted to get her story published and she was working with different writers. Uh, every writer she worked with, she would get frustrated because they couldn't capture her voice. She mm. said, this story has to be told in my voice. Uh, so then uh, she would get, get so frustrated because in one, you know, when somebody says, what's a Michigana, Rusty would mm. say, oh, if you don't know what a Michigana is out next, next, next. Yeah. Uh, mm. So somebody who can capture her voice and still write the story and understand the judo and the nuances, but make it palatable for the non-judo person, because it is more than that. It's, it's a love story and it's perseverance. So she started writing her own memoir. And mm -hmm. we would sit and write it together. She's like, okay, what are you doing? I said, well, I was about to, good, come over. And that's how the conversation <laughs> was. I said, but I'm at work. Okay, good. After work, I'll see you. What time are you going to be here? Yeah. Uh, and that's how it would be. So I'd go over the house after work and we would sit pen to paper or she would type out a chapter in the day. And then I'd go through it and either redline and fix it and say, okay, this is better. And we would do that for every mm -hmm. single bit. And then she, I would, and, and we had this deal. I'm like, okay, the statute of limitations has expired for everything. So, but make Ooh. sure because mom, I'm in law enforcement. Okay. Yeah, you got to exactly. keep that in mind. So, well, she said, well, prepare yourself. Cause you're going to learn a few things about me. Mm. Uh -oh. Uh, oh. She, she, how she boosted cars when she was mm. younger. Um, how her mom, her, her and her mom to raise money. Her mom would throw her in front of a car. Oh, God, oh. not the insurance oh. thing, the insurance scams. <laughs> well, oh, it yeah. wasn't the insurance scam. It was more mm. like they hit the brakes and, and Rusty would look so frazzled because she wouldn't, it would be a slow moving vehicle. So oh. she kind of just push her. And now keep in mind the time, the era, 1950, mm. 1950. So the era, okay. So the Studebaker would drive very, very slowly. Rusty would like just jump out in front and the guy would hit his brakes. And then he'd say, oh, you poor thing. Can I buy you an ice cream? Would that make you less shaken? And she'd say, sure. And that would be it. So mm -hmm. it, it was very more, a lot more innocent than, you know, the nefarious, what we think where, where our minds go today. So yeah, just keep well, our life point. has changed. I know you're yeah. in law enforcement, a special agent. I Nancy, Nancy, I was going, we've got a secret agent. She goes, no, she's got the specials. It's a, it's a <laughs> saying with us, it's the specials. We do a lot of, we, you know, as we travel the country, we do a lot of pet sitting and some dogs and some cats, they require the specials to get them to eat. It's the specials, but uh, mm -hmm. being a special agent and from your background in judo and also your mom, being an investigator, doesn't all of that help you do, I mean, you've done some amazing cases, 9-11, um, doesn't that help you with your focus and then persistence, you know, in pursuit of getting the story? Well, it does. Uh, as far as, you know, what I try to do is uh, I'm very fair. I really want to gather the facts. You know, we have this, mm -hmm. this joke, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Right. But I, I want to know Back the facts. Web. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to know the truths. And even if it's your, your version of the truths, I want you to talk to me, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't believe in confirmation bias. Oh, go get him to confess because, you know, we think mm -hmm. he's good for this. No, I, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I believe in developing a rapport. I believe in talking to people. And I really believe uh, sometimes there are just 
good people that make poor choices. And then sometimes mm-hmm. they're just people that are inherently bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and my job is not to judge you. My job is to gather the facts and let the prosecutor do what they want to do with it. That, mm-hmm. That's my, my job is really to get a neat little package and protect the public. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what I've sworn to do. I've sworn I have a, a duty to protect the public. So mm-hmm. I've, I, you know, part of my job is I do arrest warrants and search warrants and serve subpoenas and, and cool. do in, interviews, interrogations. Um, and I love talking to people, uh, depending on what I'm doing. But you know what? The judo has really allowed me to uh, be comfortable with use of force. Mm. I feel very comfortable hands on. So it doesn't have to, if possible, escalate to a a deadly force situation. Um, My judo training has allowed me to stay focused on what I'm doing, Mm. not get distracted, but also really take things in so that I can apply my skills with the least amount of force necessary for the action Mm. that I'm about to do. Now, Mm. granted, if it's full on all on then that it is what it is but if it doesn't have to be if i'm just going to go hands on and i can subdue somebody before it escalates well that's a that's, great contribution yeah. from my training as mm-hmm. well as understanding that from my psychological background and you know having a phd in psychology is really just a lot of fun because you have to you know it helps you understand and you don't need a phd in psychology but Knowing about people and, and their behavior, knowing about resilience, knowing sometimes when people are yelling at you, they're not yelling at you. They're just yelling. Mm. You know, they're just yeah. yelling, yelling or they're off gassing, like we would say in scuba diving. So taking that not to, uh, and not taking that to heart can really help with how you deal with people, how you deal with public. And granted, yes, a lot of things are changing. Some things are changing for the better. Some things are not changing for the mm. better. Um, you know, but change is slow. You know, the wheels mm-hmm. of justice turn very slow. But mm-hmm. being uh, having a judo background and having Rusty as my mom was so impactful in my career. And also, some there are some funny moments where I would have somebody in custody, and uh, I would say, "Hey, listen, I'm about to interview somebody." But anytime she called me, I'd answer the phone because it's my mom, and that's what I would do. And she would tell me, "Well, make sure you ask him this." And I'm like, "Mom." I got this. Or she'll call me and ask, what are you doing? Well, I'm on surveillance. Well, it's cold out. Are you wearing your vest? Yes. This sounds well, very are familiar. <laughs> are you wearing a sweater? Yes. Well, don't let the bad guys see you. Well, if I stay on the phone, maybe it's a good idea if I get off the phone. <laughs> or when we were writing the book, she would write a part of, part of the chapter and send it to me and then call me as soon as she hit the send button and ask me, hey, did you read my email? Yeah. Yes, this sounds familiar. And now you also call her mm-hmm. Rusty. You know, like I call Nancy Nancy. And mm-hmm. I did it since I was a young kid because when she had her magazine in South Africa, yeah. you couldn't just pick up the phone when someone called in and go, hey, Ma, there's a call for you. It's Coca-Cola wanting to know about their ad. That didn't work, you know. Well, and it's, so how did it go for you to call her Rusty? I only started calling her Rusty uh, for when we started this project. Mm-hmm. I only referred to her as Rusty when we were international or somebody would say, hey, somebody, you know, who's the coach? And I would say Rusty, mm-hmm. not my mom. Yeah. But it was so funny. Rusty would always, we'd always call Rusty mom or the mother. Uh, not only was she the mother of women's judo, she was everybody's mother, but mm-hmm. sometimes she was just straight up the mother. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Don't See, that, that's with the it. Mother. I know you don't mess with the mothership. You know, that's what we say, the mothership. But it's, yeah. you know, I think that's a very interesting thing because uh, having that mother daughter bond, you know, they always talk the mom and the, and the daughter and the, and the father and then the, the mom and the son, but it is a very interesting relationship and it's empowering yes. when you connect on it with that kind of level. And I think all moms and daughters need to have that because every mom does something. Yours is in judo, mom's in, my mom's in magazine land, you know, and all kinds of other things, but there's, if every mom has their quality and every daughter has, and if they can unite, it's going to be a better world and more it's, empowerful. And we have to, as women, empower each other, whether or not it's a biological mom, mm-hmm. some, some are grandmas well, or, you know, I think Lisa, 
how many times people have asked how it is that we manage to work with each mm -hmm. other together and for this, the amount of years that we have done that. And they're like, oh, you know, they all love their daughters, but they're like, I can't even think of working with my daughter. And the daughters would say the same thing. They love their mothers, but there's no way they're working together. You know, because th that it seems like an impossible thing to most women, mm. which is really unfortunate. Mm. But and it isn't that easy. I just have to say. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I gave my mom a hard time. Uh, I'm sure she did. Wait, I, I'm sure I was a. <laughs> but pain you could at choke each other out. Apparently, I yeah. know. Well, I, I have to tell you the one story where you know my, we talk about mindfulness and on mm. the mat. Well, my mom was teaching at the same time, but she was training me. So there's one part where she's anchored down by two grown men and I am to attack her with a judo throw at full speed and full power. Okay. Well, she was, she turned her head to direct another student to do something. So she wasn't being very mindful. So because she wasn't being very mm -hmm. mindful and the two guys anchoring her were not being mindful because they thought that we were taking a break. The only one who didn't think we were taking a break was me. I came in full speed, full attack oh. at our judo school on a throw called Oso Dogari, which is a rear weep, uh, reaping leg technique. So you sweep the leg out and they fall backwards. Oh, Not only did I do that to poor Rusty, oh my goodness. I hit her so hard, we went through the wall of our judo oh. school. So the two of us are laying there with plaster all over us. My father's on the other side of the mat. The judo students were terrified. They did not know what to do. Oh, Rusty gosh. and I just sat there looking at each other. Of course, probably the little birdie going over our head, laughing. No, yeah. like we could funny. not catch our breath. My father walks over this sweet Japanese man and says, oh, now I must fix wall and walks <laughs> away. <laughs> the students still didn't know what to do. So of course my mother's like, you morons help us up. Yeah. <laughs> we were stuck in the wall. That's funny. That's funny. That is that funny. Really I, love is funny. I love it. I, I love that, you know, and also uh, I want to tell everyone the website, right, uh, to go to because this isn't just a website. Uh, you go to Rusty Kanokogi and it's K-A-N-O-K-O-G-I. Uh, go there because this is a project, which I love. So it's the Rusty Project. So this is something that is you're not just here's the book. This is something that you're just continuing the movement for women. From what it I'm is. Yes. Uh, and this is going to be through speaking through the stories that I use. You know, storytelling is historic as far as mm -hmm. transferring messages. And uh, I, I believe it was different cultures use storytelling mm -hmm. to convey mm -hmm. messages. And with Rusty's book and Rusty telling the story in her voice, it gives stories of empowerment and get up and fight. Now behind me, you see, it says in life, either you are the hammer or the mm -hmm. nail, be the hammer. But here's the thing, what is the hammer? The hammer is mm -hmm. not a bully. The hammer is something that's fluid, something that keeps moving, something mm -hmm. that is strong, something that has direction. The nail just stands there and gets hit on the head. Mm. So <laughs> what do you want to do? Do you want to stand there and get hit on the head or do you want to be the hammer to build something? Because granted, you need the nail to hold it together, mm -hmm. but you need the hammer to make it happen. So mm -hmm. that's where that comes from. And also get up and fight does not mean go outside and pick a fight with somebody. Right. No. Your, your get up and fight is personal. Get up and fight is maybe getting up and getting out of bed that day. Maybe deciding to go on further that day. Maybe your get up and fight is as small as waking up and getting out of bed. I mean, that everybody has their different get up and fight. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I volunteer as the director of mental health and peer support for federal law enforcement officers association. Uh, what I do is I help people with their get up and fight other federal mm -hmm. agents, uh, current and retired. Mm -hmm. So part of project rusty is reaching out and helping people find their get up and fight their get up and fight is through rusty's diversity and inclusion my judo school was in flatbush avenue in brooklyn in one of the roughest parts so mm. i grew up on the mat with my brothers and sisters from haiti from jamaica from awesome. uh, rich kids poor kids it didn't matter mm. we were on the mat we were all one mm. so it did not matter so before even diversity and inclusion were, were a narrative 
This was my life. This is what I lived. This is what I continue to live. And this is part of this empowerment because I want everybody to know that you can be anybody. You can be a poor kid from Brooklyn and change the world like Rusty did. And Absolutely. With not a penny this in her pocket. True. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. What a great yeah. story and something to continue to live by. It's, it's a living story. And mm -hmm. I love that you're moving it forward and keeping people inspired to, to kick some butt and be the yeah. hammer. Now, before mm -hmm. you go, I, I know you've got a Facebook, right? You've got social media going on in Facebook. So I was on there today and I'm like, who is that cute little puppy? Who's that <laughs> puppy? <laughs> well, if you go on our website, you'll see he's part of our team. That's yes. That's Eddie. He, we, uh, we adopted him uh, from the Monmouth County SPCA. And I mentioned that because they're going to be getting the proceeds to our upcoming June 5th global release launch. Uh, so we're going to make a donation to the SPCA where we adopted Eddie. Cool. Uh, and yeah, a nice. little crazy Eddie. He makes sure that uh, I get a few miles of a walk in a day. Otherwise I have to buy him a hamster wheel, a treadmill. Uh, but he's, <laughs> he's the sweetest thing ever. Awesome. Mm, awesome. I love that you rescued a yeah. pup. Uh, it's so important that we take care of pups. And I know during COVID, a lot of people rescued animals and I'm like, please stay with them. Don't yes. do the, like, I want to return my, my child. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can't do that. Um, unless it's mm -hmm. not a good situation. Everything is different, but thank you so much for joining yeah. us and for continuing uh, Rusty's story out there. It's been a true pleasure. It really has been a pleasure, especially to meet both of you, Lisa and Nancy, and, and spend this time together. Thank you. Thank you. Here's Thank to you. moms and daughters, man. May yeah. we all rock up.